Welcome to the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast, where you'll discover new opportunities to grow your business from seven figures to eight from the world's most successful agency and B2B SaaS executives. I'm your host, Corey Quinn. Let's jump into the show. Today, I'm joined by the CEO of Healthcare Success, Stuart Yandoff. Welcome, Stuart. I love the radio voice, Corey. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, uh, actually, it was, it was my wife. I think it was my wife or my mom. It's, it's, it's embarrassing. I, I, I mix those two up. But they, they said, I love your energy on your podcast. You have such good energy. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm having I, a good I time. I do the so. same thing. It's really important to get your <laughs> listeners paying attention from the very beginning. Yeah, right. Exactly. Would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and your background with the listening audience? Sure. I think we're going to talk about that maybe more. So I'll just say, I am Stuart Gandalf. I'm yeah. CEO of an agency, a digital first integrated agency in the healthcare market. And we've got about 40 people. We're growing. And I was introduced to Corey I don't know, about half a year, a year ago, and we're friends and just happy to help and share some of my experiences with your audience, Corey. Beautiful. Can you share with the audience a little bit about what your agency Healthcare Success does, who you serve, the type of services you provide? Yeah, that's relevant actually to the whole story. So we are, it's a long, long road that we can talk about as much or as little as you want to later, but <laughs> I sort of stumbled into this world that we're in with healthcare and um, but the short answer for right now is today we're working with definitely multi-location healthcare providers. So it could be uh, multi-location of any medical specialty or dental specialty, addiction, and then also work with health systems and pharma and device. But especially those multi-location providers is our niche. Beautiful. And tell us a little bit about your role there as CEO of the agency. What is your day to day like? <laughs> I did that CEOs don't work very hard, at least for me. That's a myth. I work really, really hard. So as much as possible, I delegate. So I delegate whenever I can, yeah. but I still work probably 12 hour days. And so my leadership is as CEO, I have to be the, you know, make the decisions about strategy. I have to make the decisions about management with my team. I do have a management team who's strong. So my job is to be a leader, to be a coach, to be a mentor to make the business decisions tough, even when I don't want to. And then on top of that, I'm still pretty involved with business development. And part of the whole concept we'll probably be talking about today is scaling. And, uh, but still th for our niche, the expertise is really important. So I'm still involved with business development. I have salespeople, I have a whole bunch of sales stuff, but I still lead the marketing function, but all the other functions in our agency, like digital, SEO, creative di or design, writing, programming, project management, accounting, those are all managed by other people. So that's this is the only place where I still play in the machine. <laughs> Everybody else, there's leadership yep, operationally. Else. Mm -hmm. What's the origin story? Tell us how you got started with healthcare success. What were the things that led to you starting this? Can I take it a couple of steps back? Because I think it's... it's a of course, scary. yeah. Take it, take us from wherever you think it would be uh, helpful. Yeah. Well, I always thought I was going to be an engineer and because I was good at science and math. Got into engineering and was quite bored by it. So I stumbled into marketing. I also knew that I always wanted to leave where I grew up was Ohio. And as soon as I could, I escaped once upon graduation. It's like a whole other <laughs> story. But anyway... So I stumbled into working and the big thing is I started on a direct response company and start, learned that whole world and then migrated my way to J. Walter Thompson. So worked out of the client side into the agency world and worked on back in the 90s, a really big uh, agency client was um, Bally's Total Fitness and the, that core company. And so we had an $80 million budget in 90s money. <laughs> so that was a big, big budget, mm. probably the biggest. In our and that... And that was all for direct response? The Bally's, we had shares, you know, I mean, these are big, big, they're still big names, but back then they were huge names. So we had Cher, Sheena Easton, yeah. and Heather Lockley as our spokespeople. And so it was oh, mostly wow. traditional advertising, but I was the account supervisor for the direct response side of it. And so it was more, and ours was about maybe 10 million of that, still a lot of money for back then. That's, it was a huge budget. It's still, it's, good, it's yes. still good money. And so yeah. um, it was there I figured out that I'm also a creative person, not just a suit, because I thought I was a suit at first. And then eventually I got, I was really annoyed that my salespeople were making a whole lot more money than I was as an account supervisor. 
And so I took a leap into sales and doing some other stuff, but eventually got recruited into this, now we're finally where you ask, this business that did a niche company working with doctors, and this is in the mid 90s to early 2000s. And I thought, how do you guys make any money with this? So I think that'll be relevant to your readers, right? And that company actually was a real pioneer in this idea of niching. And so it was a content, this is before the words content marketing were even imagined. <laughs> like this was not copy, popular parlance at all. This was all new. So the model there was, that we would sell a newsletter to these doctors. And these are small individual little doctors and they'd spend a hundred bucks. Then we'd upsell them to a seminar. And then we'd from there upsell them to agency services. And so that was the model. And I stumbled into this knowing direct response, knowing marketing, and had I thought this was gonna be a six month job tops. So I was I got into commercial real estate and I was about to finally make $300,000, which back then was massive money. And then the riots happened and yeah. I was poor again. <laughs> it was really getting tiresome. <laughs> so I thought I'd be doing this for about six months, but uh, it turned out that I was a speaker. So I was traveling around the country and flying all around. Corey, I had never spoke before. So anybody that's in your audience that might be speaker phobic, I had never spoken before. And I committed to a job where I was leading a small group of like 12 people for three days. I'd never spoken before. <laughs> That's a big leap to go from then, zero to three there. And these are these these are the seminars which were an upsell from the newsletter. Right, is, that, exactly. is that what these were? And yeah, so okay. the model there was just sharing all kinds of best practices and best understanding and and taking this world of a very unsophisticated marketing audience and helping them understand how it works, why it works, all of that. So and it turned out I was a good teacher. I didn't know. I didn't you don't know until you do it, right? But I just figured I had to learn this stuff. Again, I understood the marketing really deeply, so it was easy for me. It was an easy transition to teach it. But I found that when working with doctors, and this is probably true with a lot of audiences, that it's all about credibility. And they liked me because I was credible. And especially doctors, doctors are used to being the smartest in the room. And if you come out and tell them something that they saw, like let's say, for example, my big joke here is, if you're a financial planner and you're telling them stuff they just saw on Susie Orman, like, get out of here, stupid. You don't know anything. <laughs> this is stuff right. I can learn anywhere. Yeah. So that lack of expertise means that you're just one of the crowd with everybody else. And so meanwhile, we had specialized knowledge. And then over every, over those 10 years I did that, I did hundreds of venues during that time. So I became absolutely expert and I got better every time. And the, one of the things that was also great about that experience was not only did I understand nephrology, gastroenterology, physiotherapy, or whatever, is that I got really used to being on my feet and being able to interact with the audience and being able to be expert. And so it became unconsciously competent. And so those were mad skills. And to this day, I tell my team, I wish I could just suck that out of my brain to share that experience. Because people say like, how do you go in these yeah. meetings and just wing it? Like, well, it's not really winging it. It's just, you know, years and years and years and years and years yeah. of experience. Yeah. Unconscious yeah. competence. That makes perfect yeah. sense. So that was a fantastic how long, experience. How long did you end up? You said you were going to be in there six months. It was going to be sort of a touch and go. How long did you end up staying? I was there for 10 years. And so it's funny. I, worked okay. there. <laughs> I became really good at it. And yeah. I eventually, actually during the internet age, I dropped out sort of, but I stayed as a consultant. So I still was there for 10 years. Then they brought me back as VP of marketing. And I was also at that period that the term fractional CMO didn't exist, but it's kind of what I was. I was VP of marketing at this company and two others at the same time. And so the whole yeah. journey lasted about 10 years. And then I left the business for a few years. And then the fun fact is, and this will also be relevant to your uh, listeners. So I'd left and I was now doing high end estate tax mitigation. So I, just, I love to just throw myself into things and figure it out. <laughs> so, but I hated leaving yeah. all that knowledge in the field or just like let it go file yeah. in the field. So my former business partner asked me, hey, do you want to start a company? I'm like, well, let's see what we can do. So I went out to like medical economics and we did a audio CD series that we sold on a co-op basis. We I went to dental economics and I wrote a column. It was fun. I was doing these estate tax deals and I was going to the recording studio recording these audio CDs between meetings. So, but again, it was stuff that I did before. It was very natural. And then we created a website with SEO in mind from the beginning. This is 2006 is when we founded the company. So, you know, we rocketed to the top of terms like healthcare marketing immediately. 
And so, and because we're at the top of Google, we got, we kind of saw everything that was going on. So that's really the origin story. It's not like a simple story, but it really, the interesting thing was, again, I joked that we were doing content marketing wildly before that ever became popular. We were doing, we called it a, a newsletter, but it was a blog, you know, way, way back. We were doing conference calls before they had webinars back in the nineties, <laughs> you know, conference so like, we right. just yeah. always did that. And it's always been, for me, Corey, the education just works. My dog's in the background. Sorry. That's great. Um, no, I love it. But, um, <laughs> he's listening intently. He's arguing with me. It's always worked for me to be the expert in the room. It just gives me the confidence that I like. It plays to my strength, and that's why we did it. So it makes niching a whole lot easier if you have that kind of experience. Can I ask you just a quick clarifying question? The so you mentioned in 2006 was that when you started launching the C audio CDs talking you know on the on the topic of doctor yeah. marketing is that yeah. what that was so that kind of, I think it was something like 27 proven ways to you know grow your practice of marketing something like that you can probably still buy it on Amazon last I checked it was still there but we, but awesome. we did it on a co-op deal so uh, they don't do it anymore with medical economics but we did a revenue share so it was awesome I actually made a lot it was like I made six figures from that. And it brought us tons of new business. And so because of that, because of our, you know, our experience in the SEO, we never took a loan in the company ever. And we just sort of started the whole, it was honestly, Corey, an experiment. I just wanted to see, I was still doing something else. It was an experiment to see if I could yeah. get an agency off the internet. And it was funny yeah. though, another thing that might your, hopefully be helpful to your audience that all that time I was doing that, I wasn't trying to build my reputation. I was working for this other company. I wasn't worried about my own personal reputation. But when we found the company with that much sort of credibility, we did have, people knew who I was already. That helped. And so it wasn't like a huge builder for us, but it definitely gave us open doors for us. And so we just went straight at it. And anyway, so that's how we started. And so... You it sounds like you probably just focused on the medical sort of um, the was it doctors exclusively or was it medical practices yeah. and and healthcare organizations? So when we started, we kind of did very similar to what we did in the past. So the old company I worked with, we broke down and we talked about not just the sort of traditional advertising stuff, but branding and how to build doctor referrals and how to get patients to refer. So it was much more consultative. And we were taught a lot of yeah. stuff that we don't do or we didn't do very much of because it just, you know, help them be successful. But really at the end of the day, sure. we're selling mostly like, you know, branded brochures and collateral and, you know, some ads and stuff. Interestingly, when we first started, even though we were doing a lot of digital marketing for ourselves, we didn't sell that much of it because the clients didn't want it. They weren't ready for it. But over time, we became more and more digital. And when I took over the company, like I said, we just sort of picked up, it's kind of like you turn the lights off in another room, you walk in, you turn the lights on, it's the same thing. But we began pivoting pretty quickly. One of the things that we, you know, some of the things that may be, you know, valuable to your listeners again is I decided, and I used to use this metaphor, like selling projects is like a shark where you just have to keep swimming in order to breathe and you never rest and you yeah. finally get, so, you know, a tuna. You eat it, then you have to go back and hunt again. It's exhausting. And the con the theory was, I'm big on metaphors, Corey, as you know. <laughs> the theory was in the old company was that, well, doctors really don't want to pay ongoing. They just want a transaction. And so that's what we thought. But if, what I realized was it's exhausting for us and unfulfilling for them because what, at least for us, what they want as a partner. Now, over time, though, we also moved away from that audience of little individual practices because it's a bloodbath. And as, as marketing automation became, or as marketing tech became more prominent and low end competitors. So today at the low end, there's millions of little competitors out there and they're all built about yeah. scale. People are always looking at what we do though. But the thing is like for us and, and our market is we just have such deep knowledge. <laughs> that it's, it's a, a little bit of a barrier to entry because, you know, getting into the mm -hmm. VR to sure. be able to speak so, you know, authoritatively is a big competitive advantage for us. So my experience in serving these types of markets is that the buyer of your services is not necessarily going to be very sophisticated or at least have, be able to distinguish between, let's say, someone who isn't as experienced as you are, but has a really flashy website and a really flashy promise. How do you 
communicate that expertise and those years of experience and the reps that you have in this space so that so that you stand out and differentiate? So it's really interesting. So it, you're right. Many times they don't. Like everybody wants, here's a couple sad truths. Like one is everybody wants expertise. That doesn't mean everybody wants to pay for it. <laughs> So, <laughs> so everybody really seriously wants expertise. Not everybody's right for us. And that's important, I think, for your, if you're, if you're talking about agencies anyway, to understand not everybody's yeah. right for you. There are some people out there that are win-lose guys or gals. They're just win-lose. It's their nature. They, they live to beat you up. They live to grind you down and just have to pass because you'll hit yourself and your team will hit you and you'll lose people over it. There are people that... And I don't think it's they mean to be, you know, bad people, but it just, it, they don't make a good partner for us. We just can't do it. It doesn't make economic sense. Not the way we do business. Sure. The second thing is some people are not very sophisticated. And so for us, the, the key thing is so the tips are, number one, we ask really, really well when we're doing this right. <laughs> some people are better at this than others in our company, but we ask really insightful questions and they know within minutes that we know what we're doing. So I don't have to talk about my credentials very much because if I'm talking about my credentials, we do, you know, in an opening three minutes or five minutes. But if you're talking about yourself very long, you'll lose them. They don't care about you. They care about themselves. So, yeah. you know, it's like, we did this, we did that, we did this, we did that. But let me ask you, what, you know, what was it that grabbed your attention today? So those kinds of questions yeah. immediately get them engaged. And it's just sales, you know, manship really, mm -hmm. I would say. Anyway, so that's that crowd. However... What I, it's what I'm also seeing, Corey, is that there are people that are sophisticated. And that's another thing that we didn't, I honestly underestimated. We made the transition to larger clients a number of years ago. I didn't, I underestimated how much the service level and investment in people has to wildly go up to play in that league. It's not just, well, boy, I got a bigger deal. It's like, you have to be the real deal. So some of our clients are very, very sophisticated. And so what's great about that is, it's kind of like a fine wine. They appreciate us so much the better. So for us, you know, it used to be definitely they were all unsophisticated, but where we're playing now, some are. And it's funny, we had, I'll give you two anecdotes. A couple of days ago, we had a client that, you know, was asking us about a low end or a competitor. They didn't know it was a low end competitor, but basically it was a shell. They had an account manager and the rest of the company was just doing tech stuff in India, but they thought it was like the same levels yeah. as us. And it's like, well, actually, yeah. let's take a look at their uh, LinkedIn profile over here. So it's important because yeah. clients that even like, and the other thing too, is some clients will gain familiarity with you and they forget how, you know, the expertise you have. On the other hand, though, like yesterday, I talked to a private equity based multi-location business. It's a direct competitor of my, one of my clients and I couldn't take him, but he wanted to do networking, but he was just blown away. So he gets it. You know, he understood like, you know, having yeah. seen our content, seeing the way we approach things, he's like, oh my God, the moment that they, if they're ever dumb enough to leave you, call me. So it's that built-in credibility yeah. is huge. And, you know, I gave him some free advice because, you know, the world's small. <laughs> Try it, out. it is small. Yeah. I love that. So just kind of, uh, just to feed this back to you, the takeaway here, or one of the takeaways I'm getting from this is you moved away from individual practices, moved towards these larger clients. And as you did that, you had buyers and clients who were demanding more sophistication because they they themselves were more sophisticated. Absolutely. Thereby, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. And again, it's not always, but even when they're not, they could be really sophisticated what they do. But for our marketplace, they're looking for somebody who's absolutely expert. That's our niche. There's other people that, you know, another deal that we lost this week, we were more expensive, you know? So, and it's like, really? Our fees aren't that high, but if they're looking for the <laughs> cheapest, that's not us. I can't afford to pay all these people yeah. at that level. And so another thing that we talk about a lot is, and Corey, this fits with you, your philosophy. You know, a lot of agencies are really bent around or built around scaling. And so it's a lot more profitable than we are, but that's not really our approach. We want to scale. But we're not like, you know, like a, a lot of agencies are better at having rules for their clients to follow, you know, like you're going to get this and that and nothing else. And, you know, that's great, but it just isn't the way we position ourselves. So we're a little different than that. Sure. I wish we were more like that, yeah. but that's not why clients hire us. They like having sort of a, you know, more, not completely custom approach, but more customizable, I think. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. They, they, they... 
I imagine looking for a partner and consultative relationship where they can come to you with questions about this or that. Anything they, they, they want to know, expertise. Corey. Almost anything. I mean, yeah. really, from <laughs> two decades plus of this, and you know, my team is really yeah. strong. And then there's other couple of my team that have been doing this like I have for so long. So that's added value that fits between the lines. And maybe another theme yeah. that might be helpful, Corey, with your audience is that you know you're talking about and i love the stuff you're writing by the way so i think it's really great it rings true with the stuff that i've observed and i'm learning from you too right after all these years of doing this but one of the things you talk about and i think this is really important is not just selling them and positioning for them but you it's easier to create a product that you're not restarting from scratch every time right so that's really big and so that's a big time saver if you're not trying to figure out how to sell. Okay, now I've got a bank. Now I have a plumber. Now I have a, you know, car <laughs> auto repair shop. Like, well, what, well, how do you spell yeah. auto repair, right? Like, so it's yeah. on the. But the other thing is the part that I, don't, I haven't seen you write as much about is the added value you can bring because the network we have is so deep. If they want like software, we can tell them which what our experience is. We can talk about which vendors are good for, you know professional referrals or call centers or, you know, programming. We don't always have the right answer. Like I'll give you a great example in our world right now, there's a lot going on with Facebook and pixels and HIPAA. And so, you know, I called, we have a relationship with one of the leading law firms in healthcare. So I called their HIPAA guy, who's the one that's defending the health systems. So it's like, I have that kind of experience that I know exactly where to go to. So therefore I can help our clients. And then I also have the credibility with a law firm like that where they'll talk to me. So that's like all yeah. between the line stuff that's really helpful. So as you grow your niche and whatever your respective field is, there's all kinds of benefits that are not necessarily tangible, but they're intangible and really helpful. Yeah. I also think they're, they're potentially a, a moat, you know, and you're comparing, you know, being compared against, let's say, you know, a company like, web.com that's sort of all things to all people they're not going to be able to have that level of you know, expertise absolutely um, i mean it, it's just it's yeah. really again for me corey it's just too exhausting not to like you know it's <laughs> funny like i people often ask like and people hmm. on my team have sort of a lot of passion around healthcare, and i do too but i just like what i do you know i could have done something else it didn't have to be <clears throat> for me healthcare. I mean, I could have done marketing for a lot of different niches, but I do love healthcare. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it, but yeah. there's other things I could have done. But, you know, the idea of sitting there and, and saying, it's funny, going back to this guy that wanted to hire us yesterday, I couldn't because we have a conflict. You know, he's like, oh my God. He's like, the reason why I love you guys is everybody else, and this goes right to your, your podcast, is every digital agency is telling me exactly the same stuff. You're not just giving me the same stuff about why your digital is better and you know, retargeting or paid search or low funnel and all that, you're giving me insights that I don't even know about my own business. <laughs> and so like, yeah. that's, again, it just makes it easier for us to compete at that level. And, but it's exceedingly hard. It's hard to recruit. It's hard to scale. And it's hard to get to that level of expertise. Cause like the, the other thing that makes us a little unique is that we are truly integrated. So a lot of agencies and you know, I'm not recommending this. This was really hard, <laughs> but you know, a lot of agencies are mostly digital. And so they're focused on the digital side, like paid search and SEO. Others are branding. It took us forever, but we really do have strength in all those categories. And so that's another differentiator for us, but it's hard to do that. I mean, it took us years to stop for that. Hey, it's Corey. Almost every day I talk with agency owners who are frustrated with getting their outbound program off the ground. The truth is too many agencies are too dependent on inbounds and referrals to grow their business. We all know that it's getting harder and harder to generate inbounds and that it's just not a sustainable way to grow your business. I'd like to give you the six secrets for driving consistent ROI from your outbound that I learned as Scorpion's chief marketing officer, where we doubled the business from 20 million to 40 million just by adding outbound to an existing inbound only program. It's a free six day email course that will transform your outbound from broken to consistently driving new sales opportunities. You could sign up and get the first secret right now by going to get outboundroi.com that's get outboundroi.com now back to the show could you talk a little bit more about what that means because integrated 
to some people may think like, oh, you do paid social and PPC, right. and then to other people, yeah, it's gonna, it. you know, a lot of different things, online, offline. You well, know, my, my what simplistic does that mean? definition when I'm talking to clients is that it used to be, you know, advertising agencies that was the thing, and then from there. You know, it kind of broke into this new world of digital agencies. And so digital agencies, usually the ones we come across are doing a lot of paid search, maybe paid social, maybe programmatic. And that's like a whole thing. And that's where most, it's funny, it's gone from nothing, right? It used to be nobody, nobody did it at all to probably two thirds of agencies at least are doing those kinds of services. And then you typically had, now it's like, there's a whole bunch of branding people that oftentimes are baby boomers getting ready to retire that really want to do creative and do branding. And so what's interesting though, is if you ask most digital agents, oh yeah, yeah, we have creative, we have branding. Or if you ask most branding companies, oh yeah, yeah, we have digital. They don't really. And so like, you know, it's, yeah. and that's what I'm saying is we've, we all, we were in that category for a while there. We had really good digital and our creative was good-ish. You know, our writing was awesome, but our design was just okay. So that, like I said, that's hard to do. I mean, it really is because what we find too, another thing that you may, may be helpful to some of your listeners is that like really good talent wants to be with other talents. So like SEOs want to be with other SEOs, you know, branders want to be with branders, you know, content people want to be with the content people. So building an agency like that is really hard. It'd be easier to focus on one or two things. Like I remember yesterday you had an article on your blog about you know, I'm not just a, a, um, a marketing company for plastic surgeons. I do TikTok for plastic surgeons. Like, now that's really <laughs> hyper. And I think that was more of an, a, you know, an example than real, but it is easier to get expertise super narrow like that than it is to do it broad like we yeah. have. It's yeah. really hard. Like, Definitely complicated for sure. Today, so obviously you were very, so you shared that you were very early in digital and SEO and as a result of that, that's helped you to, to sort of grow your business. How has this concept of thought leadership impacted your your growth? Do you do, do, you do a lot of thought leadership? Um, and if so, like, what, what does that look like? Yeah, it's at the core of it. Even, I don't know what our breakdown is the number of inquiries, because now we, got, we get inquiries from the web, we get inquiries from speaking, we get inquiries from just our reputation. We're now finally getting inquiries that are just referrals. You've written about that as well. But the referrals are just years of being out there. So that really adds up. But I can tell you, I'm sure glad I don't just rely on that. <laughs> I would say another fun fact, this also fits with your philosophy, Corey, that inbound is like throwing, to me, we have fantastic inbound. So give me, don't get me wrong. I'm not like demeaning in any way inbound. We love our inbound. But it is like throwing a net into the sea every day and you pull up what you pull up. Yeah. So sometimes it's an old shoe, sometimes it's a nice, you know, minnow, sometimes it's a sea exactly. bass. Once in a while it's a whale, but you're not in control. And that's a really scary when you pull it up and you get a couple empty nets or some old shoes, right? So yeah. the net's yeah. nice, but we like to go out and we have a very aggressive marketing campaign that includes speaking, includes outreach, includes inbound. And the speaking is just part of it. And I think, you know. Like stuff like this I'm doing today because we're friends. I don't expect any business out of this. And it's like, it does happen once yeah. in a while. We do speak at select conferences, which do bring us business for sure. But I think it's more just the aura of being able to speak. Like if you go to anybody, if your listeners care, you can flip through my speakers page. You'll see, you know, decades of, and I, did, I only picked up the speakers page since we started this company, let alone before that. <laughs> so, you know, probably sure. hundreds of different speaking events we've done. And today, and it's funny, we don't really go after speaking events. They, we just kind of pick off the ones that seem like they're really relevant to us. And, you know, people reach out to us, but we're not like, you know, cold calling 50 events or whatever, because most sure. events aren't right for us. Like, even if they're another thing that, you know, like, for example, our niche, most healthcare conferences are a dog. It's like, you really, it's, you know, a lot of doctors are sort of shuffling around and that's not really our target audience. So. I mean, they're good conferences, but their focus is medical clinical care. So it just depends. Yeah. Having that knowledge matters. But I still yeah. like, so I me, still take most yeah. credible offers to speak, either me or people on my team, because, you know, it keeps our skills sharp. It gives, builds the credibility and we do get business from it as yeah. well. But it's not, I would not suggest, there are exceptions to everything, Corey, <laughs> but to build your entire business around speaking would be a little scary to me. It's a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of effort. How do you determine whether or not a conference is, 
you know, worth pursuing from a speaking perspective? You know, we've gotten better at that. Like, I'll give you an example. We worked on one that wasn't ideal for us this year. And I had that feeling going in. And it's like, because it's not really our target audience. I, I would just say, without sharing any sort of industrial secrets here, that it really comes down to our target audience. And where do we think we're going to be likely to find prospects as opposed to just people? And there's a whole bunch of things yeah. where it's not really the focus. So, you know, if you were to go to the, one of these massive conferences where, you know, you're going to, to the wrong level or the wrong type of person, you've got to be really strategic with who you're speaking at. And again, like I said, we'll yeah. take them. Like this last one, I had four people from my team, but they paid our way and it was in Fort Lauderdale. So, okay. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, we, we try to be selective for sure. Yeah. But what I'm not hearing you say is you don't spend a lot of time traveling out to SMX or these, these no, that's, internet that, those marketing are focus Like ones. I will speak at those too. Yeah. I haven't spoken to SMX sure. specifically, but I definitely don't look for business from that. And there are people who do that. But, you know, again, we're a niche agency. I'm looking for people that, you know, are in our uh, niches that we're going after. And again, the right level, right yeah. mindset is really what I'm looking for. Also, you know, like panel sessions sometimes are good. Those are great. Panel sessions are awesome because I can sure. just show up and yeah. spew. Just answer yeah. questions. Other times, <laughs> if I'm, you know, I've done keynotes where I'm like, if I've done like user conferences for clients where I'm, there are 500 best clients. Like those are like scores, right? And that, by the way, that one, the, my biggest one where I got two user groups from this big, huge oncology business, both came from my white papers. They hired me to speak as their keynote without ever seeing me speak just based off the white papers. I'm like, That's well, amazing. it's a I can speak because <laughs> you don't know that. Yeah. But that was, you, you know, lots know. of years of business came out of that. So there are, that, that, but that's where the stars align, right? We were the right, I had the podium. I was in the big show, you know, I had the TV or the screen behind me, the lights and the camera. And that was a very yep. different experience than, you know, flying to Lafayette, Indiana to speak in a, you know, breakout room for 20 people. So that's yeah. awesome. When it comes to hiring, you're a niche agency and obviously you're selling services to healthcare businesses today, multi-location healthcare uh, practices. Do you hire people with a medical or a healthcare background? Is that important no, for the work no. that you do? It's, we teach that it's, we do have some people with that. It certainly can help, but it's more yeah. like I, what we're thinking is it's about being a process expert in your field. So we can teach the healthcare. But we really want to know, like, for example, if you're an account manager, you need to have digital in your soul because that's like where most of our revenue comes from. And even though we're integrated, you've got to know that stuff in your soul. And if you're a content writer, you need to know content. And although I can say that we are gravitating in content writing more towards healthcare experience just because of the nature of the learning curve there is just so vast. So that's probably the only yeah. words is important. But it's funny, we also, people are drawn to us because of the healthcare thing. Like I said, there's a lot of people who love healthcare and they want to work with us, which is awesome. I have, you know, we have right now somebody that we're interviewing tomorrow that has no experience in anything, but she just has mad charisma. She's an athlete. She just has the right sort of core stuff. But she just, the reason we're talking to her is she picked our agency because as number one, like LinkedIn will tell you that you're like their top pick. So I'm like, okay, I'll give her a chance. But like, it's that kind of passion that makes great employees because they get the mission, yeah. they care about healthcare. So even though we don't recruit for that, we kind of find that. I just have a couple more questions for you, Stuart. What in your experience now, having you know run this agency since 2006 and your previous experience before that, what would you say to a young young agency owner whether it's young in age or just young in this in this field what are the positive aspects to verticalizing your agency well philosophically you and I are on the same page pretty old i would say first of all um like i said it's exhaust having seen agencies that do like i didn't i skipped over an agency i worked with sort of in a transition back early in my career and they were a general sort of boutique agency and they're trying to work with a big bank and then they're working with a physical therapist and they're working with somebody else. And so each time you're trying to prove your worth to who you're pitching, you don't really understand it. So it's hard to pitch to them. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're perceived as generic, they're going to grind you on fees and you have nowhere to go. You know, like my widgets yeah. are better than their widgets. They don't even care about your widgets. So 
It's really yeah. difficult to win. It's difficult to keep your fees up. It's difficult to keep them. And it's just not satisfying. That's the thing. I like being an expert. Like I really like, I put me in a room with anybody in my niche and I will, they want to talk of this shop with me. <laughs> We're going to do very, very well. And I just like that because it gives me the confidence to be able to deliver a great product. It also allows me to, you know, build the right products and share insights that they wouldn't otherwise see. I, it's just so hard. And the other thing too is yeah. that I'll share with you maybe another metaphor. So I went to sure. Robert McKee and Robert McKee is a famous screenwriting icon. And he's wrote his uh, seminar was called Structure. And he was talking about, and this was really back when I did this, you know, there was a big backlash against Hollywood sort of structure. And what is it? What's the Japanese poetry that has very strict rules? Haiku. haiku. Yeah. So it was, and haiku has so many syllables and it's a very, very, very tight rules. And he's used that as a great metaphor of, you know, if you're worried about creativity, if you have no barrier at all, everything's just a mess when you write a screenplay. When you have some sort of structure to lay everything on, that's where the real creativity will emerge. The fact that yeah. you have some constraint will make you more creative. And so I would say that's one you can steal from. That's not mine. That's Robert McKee's. What's his name? Huh. He's a, if you look it up online, it's either story or structure is the name of his seminar. Anyway, he's an icon in the industry. But I thought that was always an interesting metaphor. So whatever niche you pick, there's creativity there. And another um, thing, objection I hear a lot, one of my artists one time said, Stuart, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a really strange in so many ways. And one of them is that I'm, you know, a creative person and a business guy. And so she says, Stuart, why are you doing this business stuff? You're a creative person. Like, why are you, it's like, don't you get it? But creating a business is the ultimate creative challenge. <laughs> like, it is really, really hard, much harder than writing an ad, right? So, you yeah. know, it's like, I find the it is the biggest creative challenge. Yeah. I agree with that yeah, statement. Like better, right? <laughs> yeah. What about the negatives? What are the negatives or downsides to verticalizing your agency, if any? I would say one might be there are some people that just won't fit. They're not going to be good hires because they, especially creative people, they don't just don't want to do that. But that's okay. You have plenty of creative people looking for something that's okay. So hiring might be a little more challenging for some people. It hasn't been for us, but that is a potential downside. I would say also, like, depending on your niche, if it's cyclical, you have high risk, right? So if you're in travel, for example, during COVID, that was your um, exposure there became pretty apparent pretty fast. So, you know, one option, if you're taking a very cyclical or very sort of risky niche like crypto or, you know, travel or, I don't know, cannabis, maybe have a diversified portfolio of a couple different niches. So that you, you know, you're not going to put everything on one niche for our niche in healthcare is pretty stable and we actually kind of do better when things get worse. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. I'm not worried about us, but there definitely are cyclical businesses. And sure. that's, that's, a risk 100%. For sure. that's great advice. Last question for you. What's your motivation? I'm right now at this moment, really about growth. Like I've took forever. I cannot. Maybe I, I, I tell people, Corey, I think I've talked to you offline. Like I did everything wrong for as smart as I like to think I am. I made so many horrible decisions and not pulled the trigger on firing somebody fast enough or this or that. But I would say now it's like things are clicking and I'm just in growth mode. Like I'm really excited about growing. I'm excited about growing our clients, our number of clients, the size of clients. The team I can bring to bear now is the strongest we've ever had. And that to me is exciting. It's just really fun. Our esprit de corps is strong. Our people like being there. And, you know, during pandemic was, a, I'll say it nicely, cluster without completing the word. Pandemic was very challenging. Yeah. Or we weren't immune to that. Like, you know, I know at least three agency owners who went down during pandemic and they had good businesses. One was a branding guy who just retired because his business has dried up. One was in the clinical trials business and one was something else. So it was tough for agencies. Not everybody, but certainly a lot. And for us, you know, we um, survived it. And we made a lot of right decisions there. We kept it together despite a really challenging period. But I would say now I feel like we're dusting ourselves off of that. I'm not, I was really just sort of either in that mess or, you know, recovering for that mess for two or three years there. Yeah. But now we're focused on moving forward. And it's exciting to me. I'm really actually having fun again. 
like I used to in the old days. I'm able to spend time on the visionary things, the content things, the marketing stuff, because during COVID I had to become an involuntary workaholic, you know, administrator, which is not my thing. It's not <laughs> yeah. what I want to do. I had yeah. to, yeah. and I did it. I think a lot of us uh, did. It's like, yeah. finger, it's like bamboo under the fingernails. This is not something I enjoy, but you do what you have to to make your agency work. So during that period of just yeah. crazy worldwide transition, internal transition, client transition, that was really hard. But now I feel like we're moving forward and it's super exciting to me. Wonderful. I'm excited to watch you guys blossom and grow. It's going to be exciting. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So where, if, if someone wanted to reach out to you to follow up, whether it be to ask a follow-up question or just to learn more about your services, what, what's a good way for people to get right, in touch so with you? So healthcaresuccess.com is pretty easy. You can contact us that way. You can email me. I have an assistant that screens this, but I'll, it'll get to me. So just give me a day. Stuart at healthcaresuccess.com. Yeah. S-T-E-W-A-R-T at healthcaresuccess.com. And LinkedIn's great too. So those are the easiest Beautiful. ways to reach me. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I enjoy Stuart. it. Thank you. All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm Corey Quinn, and I hope you join me again next time for the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast. If you receive value from the show, I would love a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.